waters off the east coast of South Africa, 300 feet below the surface. Divers search for a creature that existed before the time of the dinosaurs, a living fossil. 350, 400 million years old. Some call it the ghost fish, king of the sea. Others, monster of the deep. On a moonless but fairly bright night, you can actually see those eyes glowing. For over half a century, the search has persisted. And there have been divers who've died trying to find these fish. Those who come in contact with it are changed forever. You get this kind of science fiction chill in the back of your neck and going down your spine. A creature that offers tantalizing clues to the evolution of all life on Earth, including us. I did see one alive, and I never got over that. A creature thought to have been extinct for over 50 million years. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! Ancient creature of the deep. Up next on Nova. Sadwana Bay, South Africa, a team of divers prepares to attempt a descent of several hundred feet into the Indian Ocean to search for a mysterious ancient creature. Deep dives here are always dangerous. Rescue divers are in place. An emergency medical team hovers nearby. Each diver carries several tanks different compressed gases to breathe at different depths. Any mix-up here could be fatal. This is my oxygen, it's closed. It's going to breathe this at depths deeper than 10 meters. This is A, to travel down, and on my back I have the, the helium mixture to breathe at depth. Everything is planned, down to the minute. Our total dive is going to take us uh, exactly two hours. So 15 minutes down, then on the bottom, and then the rest of the time coming up. For a quarter of an hour, they drift down through a world ever quieter, ever colder, ever darker. Then, at a depth of 300 feet, something catches their eye. We saw the, the continental drop off. We headed straight for it. We saw a cave. We went straight into that cave. Just looked underneath it. There he was. A great primitive fish, a coelacanth. Its ancestors date back 400 million years to a time when all Earth's creatures lived underwater and the great transition to living on land was about to begin. Was the coelacanth, with its fleshy leg-like fins, the missing link in evolution from fish to land animals? Coelacanths were long considered extinct, known to science only through ancient fossils that displayed these curious limb-like fins. But one fateful day in 1938, everything changed. Hello, welcome. Welcome to Six Lakes Street. Marjorie Courtney Latimer was then the 31-year-old curator of a small natural history museum in East London, South Africa. Come, welcome in. She remembers well how her life was turned upside down by the mysterious coelacanth. Nobody ever knew the difficulties 
and the trauma that I went through. I went through absolute trauma saving that fish because nobody wanted to know. I would say even my family in the end began to think I was cuckoo. <laughs> I suppose I was very cuckoo. On December 22, 1938, a fishing trawler steamed into the East London Harbour. On the deck was a pile of sea life dredged up after a freak storm. But these fish were not all meant for market. It was a pile of sponges and, and starfish and rat-tailed fish, and you name it, they were there. When putting together new exhibits at the museum, Marjorie often obtained samples from local fishermen. And from underneath this crowd, there was this one fin sticking out, this blue fin. And I thought, what on earth could this be? Then I moved all the fish. There was this beautiful, beautiful fish. Iridescent colors all over the of fish. Just solid, just, just on five foot long, rough scales, and very big eyes, very big blue eyes. The, these peculiar limb like fins, something I'd never seen in a fish in my life. Marjorie had been an avid collector since childhood. She knew instinctively that this was an important find. I thought, no, whatever happens, this fish has got to be saved. Although she was able to cart the fish back to the museum, this was 1938, and there was no easy way to refrigerate and preserve the specimen. She inquired at the local mortuary. And so I went in, and uh, this very tall, very gaunt-looking gentleman said, what could he do for me? So I said, you know, I've got this beautiful fish. <laughs> and I said, I have to try and save it. And I wondered if you could put it into the mortuary. So he drew himself up, right nearly up to the roof. And he said, I never heard of such an iniquitous suggestion. Most definitely not. Most definitely not. In desperation, she sent off a note and a sketch to a professor at Rhodes University a hundred miles away in Grahamstown. Professor J.L.B. Smith was trained as a chemist, but his passion was ichthyology, the study of fish. His work in this field would soon change the face of science. Let me take you to uh, L4. Professor Smith's one-time secretary and archivist is Jean Pote. This is it. This is a very interesting file. It's correspondence with Marjorie Courtney Latimer from 1936 onwards. And in this file is, um, I think, the original drawing. That is the original drawing by Marjorie Courtney Latimer. And as soon as he saw that, he knew that it was something really rare. For J.L.B. Smith, it was more than rare. It was an impossibility. If that drawing were correct, this fish should have died out with the dinosaurs. Smith's wife, Margaret, described his reaction. It was the 3rd of January, 1939. And I suddenly felt almost shockwaves coming from my husband, who was standing up reading a letter. And through the back of the letter, I could see a picture of a fish. And he pointed to the drawing of the tail. And he said, you see that tail? That tail belongs to fishes that have been extinct for millions and millions of years. Smith was confused and puzzled. He almost hoped he was wrong about the identification of this creature. But if he was right, the implications were staggering. Despite his initial excitement, he was unable to examine the fish in person for nearly two months. 
leaving Marjorie Courtney Latimer to deal with this strange creature alone. He probably thought I was making a mistake. Well, I'd sketched it, and I'd written all these letters to him about it. But he probably thought, you know, I was young and, and inexperienced with ichthyology. It's a funny thing to just suddenly decide about <laughs> bring a fossil fish out into the open. Marjorie was left with no choice. In order to save the fish for scientific study, she had it skinned and mounted. But without any preservatives, the internal organs had to be discarded. This was later described by Smith as one of the most terrible tragedies in science. So there were a lot of confusions in the beginning, and I got blamed for uh, losing the innards of the fish. I had to bear that all my life. But still, <laughs> the main thing was we saved the thing, for the, we saved the skin and the top specimen. On the 16th of February, at 10 o'clock, Professor Smith walked into my office. I'd been waiting for him since the 22nd of December. That first sight hit me like a white-hot blast, Smith later wrote. It made me feel shaky and queer. My body tingled. I stood as if stricken to stone. And he walked round the table. And he said, this, this fish will be on the lips of every scientist in the world. It's a coelacanth. Since J.L.B. Smith identified the strange fish, he was able to christen it. He named the genus Latimeria, after the woman who had saved the fish for science, and the species Calumni, after the river near where it was caught. The press went wild with the news, calling it the most important scientific discovery of the century. A creature from a group thought to be extinct for millions of years was alive. It was a living fossil, a window into the past. The term living fossil had been coined by Darwin. In his writings on evolution, he argued that somewhere, most likely in the ocean depths, some creatures would have eluded the pressures to evolve and changed little from prehistoric times. Now, here was a living coelacanth strikingly similar to fossils more than 50 million years old. Well, we're down in the basement of the museum now, and the um, fossil fish collection is through here. Let's open the door. John Maisie is a paleontologist at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. Collections arranged in a systematic sequence or in an evolutionary sequence. And the coelacanth fossils we keep in these cabinets. Um, for example, here are some small coelacanths uh, from, well, from, from right around here. These probably live in fresh water. These are about um, a shade over 200 million years old. Now, these didn't get much bigger than this. These coelacanths lived at a time when uh, North America was still attached to Africa. So uh, New York would have been very close to Morocco at this time. Coelacanths first appeared along with the other major groups of fishes we know today about 400 million years ago. Then the earth was more or less one large landmass. Over time, this supercontinent separated into what is now essentially the modern globe, leaving coelacanth fossils on every continent except Antarctica. These fossils had been known to science since the 1830s. They'd been found in widely varying sizes, but with several distinguishing features. An oddly hinged joint in the head. Fins that had a limb-like structure and hollow fin rays 
supporting the distinctive tail. The oddly spelled name comes from the Greek, meaning hollow spine. J.L.B. Smith wrote that finding a living coelacanth was like walking down the street and running into a dinosaur. Scientists were skeptical that the fish in East London was a true living fossil. Even Smith worried that perhaps the coelacanth had lain somewhere in the ocean bed in some preserving ooze or mud these millions of years. But Marjorie soon assured him that the fish had snapped at its captors before dying. The press played up the idea of a missing link, an idea also derived from Darwin's theory of evolution. Darwin proposed that life came out of the sea, evolving from fishes to amphibians to mammals to us over millions of years. Was the coelacanth a missing link? That interim step from water to land. Was this fish the key to understanding our own evolution? All life came from the sea. And when we realize that life is really just an evolution of forms, these are the closest relatives to our ancestors. And then we, intellectually, would like to know who was the closest, who was the missing link. John McCusker is an evolutionary biologist at the California Academy of Sciences. We're dying to know what was that step from the fishes to the amphibians. And when they discovered coelacanth fossils, they said, aha, it must be this, this thing that walked out of the water. And when they discovered the living fossil, they said, that's it our ancestor. It's alive. But Marjorie's fish was all they had, and it was only skin and bones. The innards had been lost. And we were, by such unfortunate circumstances, prevented from being able to find out what most of its body and organs were like. Were the coelacanth's internal organs like those of other fishes? or more like those of amphibians, reptiles, and mammals. It therefore became more than normally desirable, really imperative to find more. This would become J.L.B. Smith's life's work, to find another coelacanth, and this time, an intact specimen. J.L.B. Smith was a hard man. He was a very, very focused man, and uh, yeah, that tend to turn people off who didn't share his point of view. But if you... Mike Bruton works today as an ecologist here in South Africa. He studied under J.L.B. Smith. Well, J.L.B. was a remarkable fisherman and uh, actually predicted that the first coelacanth didn't naturally live off East London, that it was a, a more tropical, deep-water animal. Smith felt certain that if coelacanths were native to the highly fished waters off East London, they would have been caught many times before. He reasoned that Marjorie's fish inhabited the deep tropical reefs to the north and had been driven toward East London by currents running down through the Mozambique Channel. So he distributed leaflets all over the East African coast. Smith's leaflets, in English, French, and Portuguese, offered a hundred-pound reward, an enormous sum for a local fisherman. But he still faced tremendous odds against finding a second specimen. After all, the coelacanth had proved amazingly adept at eluding discovery. <laughs> J.L.B. Was, was a fisherman, a mad fisherman. As with the first specimen, caught by trawler fishermen, Smith was counting on those who made a living from the sea. It's very fresh. And like Smith, biologist John McCusker knows where to ask when looking for a particular fish. These men are the best ichthyologists, I'm sure. They know the differences between, the subtle differences between different species, different populations. If you want to find rare fish, you don't go to an ichthyologist or a museum. You go to a fish market. 
And these guys know fish. I mean, it's their whole life is fish. The fishermen of the Comoros Islands would prove to be a godsend for J.L.B. Smith. The Comoros are a small group of volcanic islands then controlled by the French just north of Madagascar. Here, men have fished in the same way for over a thousand years and were said occasionally to pull out of the water a fish they called Gombesa. Comoran fishermen had no idea this fish might shed light on one of the greatest scientific mysteries of all time. But the substantial reward caught everyone's attention. Then, in December 1952, from the Comoros, Smith got the telegram he'd hoped and prayed for for 14 years. It came from an English sea trader he'd met in Madagascar, Eric Hunt. Have five-foot specimen coelacanth. Injected formalin here. Killed 20th. Advise. Smith was beside himself. Did Hunt have enough preservative? It would take weeks to reach the Comoros by boat. By then, the fish might putrefy. He'd not spent all these years searching to let this specimen slip away. Smith turned to his connections in the South African government to try to borrow a plane, finally calling on the prime minister himself, D.F. Milan. Milan was at his beach cottage in, in 1952 when he got that famous phone call from J.L.B. Smith and he realized that J.L.B. Smith had something important to tell him, that South Africa's prestige was at stake. Mike As a South African, Mike Bruton remembers the story of the second coelacanth well. And uh, as a result, Milan eventually gave permission for that military Dakota to fly to the Comores, since being described as a sort of a military airplane going to a foreign country taking a mad scientist to fetch a dead fish. Well, this is uh, Dakota 6832, the one that we flew to fetch the coelacanth in 1952. Major General Duncan Ralston was a lieutenant at the time and the senior navigator on the flight that took J.L.B. Smith to the Comoros. Professor Smith actually sat about here and um, he was so tense and so excited. We had a long flight over the sea there was almost no navigation aids, but we landed, and there was the fish. The fish smelled strongly of the formaldehyde Hunt had used to try to preserve it. And it was a bit the worse for wear, having been carted across the island by the fishermen who caught it. Nevertheless, after 14 years of searching, Smith finally had his coelacanth. I could not bring myself to touch it. And I knelt down to look, and I'm not ashamed to say that after all that long strain, I wept. Professor Smith insisted that we get this fish back to the airplane and take off as quickly as possible. I'm not sure to this day whether we did in fact have proper diplomatic clearance to land at the island or to take the fish away. I know subsequently the French government were enormously cross about the whole affair because they felt it belonged to them. So we flew back. We had to fly the fish down to Cape Town because uh, Dr. Malon wanted to see it. Dr. Malon said when he saw the fish, why it's very ugly. And is this where we came from? Milan was a creationist and the father of South African apartheid. Aiding Smith in his evolutionary research was dangerous politically. But South Africa's prestige was at stake, and Milan welcomed the publicity. This is Movie Town. Arnold Larson reporting. 
Meet Professor Smith of Grahamstown, South Africa, with a model of that famous fish, the coelacanth. Coelacanths are close relatives of the fish that scientists consider was the ancestor of all land animals. The coelacanths have lived for probably 350 million years, and in that time they have changed but little. Yes, the professor says the fish is a kind of ancestor of man. Poor fish. In his lab, Smith began the first ever dissection of a coelacanth peering into a world never before accessible to science. What he discovered was that the coelacanth is different in many ways from all other modern fish. Not only did it have strange limb-like fins, it had no real backbone. Instead, Smith found a more primitive structure called a notochord. This is part of the notochord of the coelacanth that was dissected here. And it's simply a, a, a hollow tube, it's a gristly tube, which extends from just behind the brain right through into the tail. And it's filled with a light oil under a very slight pressure. This kind of oil-filled skeletal structure is unique. Most adult vertebrates have well-developed backbones, especially those that live on land, including human beings. The entire fish is, is filled with oil. There's not a single air sinus in the fish. So like a diver's depth gauge, it's incompressible, which in theory anyway, would allow it to swim on at depths of 1,000 meters or, or more. But it was the limb-like fins that really caught the attention of Smith and the world. They had their own internal skeleton, more like our limbs than the fins of a normal fish. As you see, the fins are more like paddles than ordinary fins. Indeed, our arms were developed from a pectoral fin like that of this fish. I have no doubt that this fish crawls about on the bottom quite easily. Once again, the press trumpeted the coelacanth as the missing link, a creature that bridged the gap between fish and primitive land animals. Scientists, museums, even zoos now wanted their own coelacanth. The London Zoo offered a reward of a thousand pounds for a live specimen. Smith capitalized on the excitement surrounding his find. He wrote a book, Old Forelegs, and created a legend. Three Old Forelegs, which is one of the great scientific uh, books of all time. He captured the public imagination, partly because it's a fantastic fish, but I think we must also give credit to JLB for a, a really good marketing exercise. He weaved the human story, the, all the intrigues uh, of the Camors, of his uh, working with a South African Prime Minister who didn't believe in evolution, and made the coelacan story come alive for people gave them an entree into this fantastic scientific world from which most people are excluded. Through his research and his book, Smith's name became forever tied to the coelacanth, like Marjorie Courtney Latimer's. But what of the Camoran fisherman who actually caught the fish? He's seen here getting his reward. His name is Ahmed Hussein. This is the first time he's been interviewed. Hussein says he never met Smith, but recognizes his fish. He says he got the reward but other fishermen took credit for the catch. Until this moment, not even Hussein's own neighbors knew what he'd done. But his catch, back in 1952, put the Camaros on the scientific map. From then on, this tiny archipelago would be acknowledged as the prime location for finding Latimeria columni. 
As the islands were then under French colonial rule, an international embargo was declared. Comoran fishermen, using the same time-honored methods of hook and line, would catch many more coelacanths. They would all be sent to France. For the next 23 years, the coelacanth was almost exclusively studied in the Department of Comparative Anatomy here at the Museum of Natural History in Paris. Danielle Robineau was part of the team of scientists which conducted the first comprehensive dissections of Latimeria using properly preserved specimens. This is one of the many specimens we received from the Comoros. A cut was made across the head, giving us access to the inside of the skull. One can see very clearly the most interior part of the notochord. The French team found a series of contradictory features. In some ways, the coelacanth looked very primitive, with organs and glands similar to those of sharks and rays, and a tiny heart, which is little more than an expansion in the main blood vessel. In other ways, the coelacanth resemble tetrapods, those four-limbed creatures that include everything from the very first land dwellers to human beings. There are several characteristics that show similarities to tetrapods. There's the presence of a vestigial lung. And of course, here are the lobed fins. And here, on this x-ray, we can see the vein that brings the abdominal blood back up to the heart. This vessel is a genuine vena cava, like that found in tetrapods. The vascular system of almost all other fishes is completely different. So was the coelacanth the closest living relative of tetrapods, the missing link? Some scientists said yes, others no, as they continued to explore this mysterious creature's anatomy. Its brain, which unfortunately you can't see, is incredibly small. Um, the, the, the brain case is, is probably about that size, but the brain itself is, is no bigger than the end segment of, of, of one's thumb. In the snout of the fish, a strange jelly-filled cavity was discovered. It initially puzzled researchers, but is now thought to be an elaborate electroreceptive organ. And we believe that this is used to detect minute um, electrical impulses um, put out by prey organisms. Its eye, in life, looks much bigger than that, and it's like a crystal ball. It's, it's as clear, clear, clear as anything. Um, and Comorans say that, that coelacanths have fire in, in, in its eyes, uh, and that's because it, it collects any light that's available and reflects it back, rather like a cat's eyes at night. These specialized features may help to explain why coelacanths have survived for 400 million years. Their outward appearance has changed little, but internally, they must have adapted to changing environments as the Earth itself was transformed over time. Whether the remarkable features of Latimeria developed four million years ago, or 40, or 400, we may never know. But it has found its niche and continues to avoid extinction thanks in part to two other crucial adaptations, its advanced method of reproduction and its extremely low metabolism. So they wouldn't need much food. They're living, in fact, in a low food environment. There isn't a whole lot of food around for them. And this may have something to do with their long survival. They have adapted to this low food environment. Phil Heemstra has been studying coelacanths for over two decades and has been fascinated by the way they reproduce. It looks like an orange, but it's actually a model of a coelacanth egg. This is a life-size model. They have the largest eggs known amongst fishes. The huge coelacanth eggs, 
filled with nutrients to feed the growing embryo, were discovered by the French in 1955. They were at first thought to be released and fertilized on the ocean floor, until a freshly dissected specimen yielded a surprise. In 1975, at the American Museum of Natural History in New York, they found a pregnant female with five babies inside her. So then we knew they had internal fertilization and they gave birth to living young like sharks do. Here's a model of one of those five babies. And each of them still had a large yolk sac, although the fins are fairly well developed, as you can see, the scales are developed. Although fossils had shown tiny coelacanths inside an adult, researchers couldn't tell if the adult was about to give birth or had eaten the little ones. Now they knew. Coelacanths give birth to live young and have done so for 200 million years. Well before mammals came along, the coelacanth was using a mammal-like reproductive strategy, ensuring that most of its young would survive. After decades of research, much had been learned. But well into the 1980s, no one had ever observed a coelacanth alive for more than a few hours. The coelacanth lives in deep, cold water, where the oxygen content is high. When one is caught and brought to the warmer, less oxygen-rich surface water, it cannot survive very long, especially with the stress of capture. Even today, aquariums have been unsuccessful in capturing and keeping a coelacanth alive. So no one knew how they mate, how they hunt, how they elude predators in their natural habitat. There was only one way to find out. So, go to them. Friends, that's it. In a submersible. It's nothing more than a motorized decompression chamber. The man responsible for this chamber is Hans Fricke, a zoologist at the Max Planck Institute in Germany. He's been obsessed with the coelacanth since childhood. And uh, we thought that uh, the coelacanths occur deeper than 200 meters. And this was the reason that we uh, built Yago. Yago was custom made by its pilot, Jürgen Schauer. You have uh, five lights. Each light has a power of 250 watts. So you can um, impose sunlight on the seabed. And we have five little thrusters. These side ones are rotatable. And uh, we have three in the back for propulsion, with which we can make a speed of about walking speed. It's about one mile an hour. Iago was brought to the deep blue waters of the Comoros, where, along with biologist Karen Hiesmann, Fricka and Schauer could pursue the coelacanth. One day in 1987, after hunting the fish for weeks to no avail, Fricka was called back to Germany, leaving Jürgen Schauer to continue the ever more frustrating search. We were already quite uh, desperate already, everybody on the ship. Then, at 9 p.m. on the 17th of January, at a depth of 600 feet, there it was. A coelacanth. We did not know how the fish will behave. Usually the fish swim away when they see the strong lights of Yago, but this fish didn't care about the lights. It's so large and it's moving in such a different way than other fish do, which makes it really a spectacular experience to, to discover a fish like this. Schauer immediately radioed Fricka with the exciting news. Jürgen called me with a ship radio, and I said to him, give everybody a kiss, I give you a bottle of champagne, and so on and so on. I was very, very enthusiastic about it. And on the end of the con conversation, the operator said, what the hell is this, what you were talking about? I said, the coelacanth. And uh, he, he asked me, what is a coelacanth? I said, it's an old, ugly, oily fish. At 
As expected, coelacanths were found to live in a fairly uninhabited ecosystem and seem to have no real predators. They aggregate during the day in volcanic caves and at night have been known to migrate to depths of over 2,000 feet. But unexpectedly, films of the coelacanth showed how the multiple fins function and laid to rest the idea of a crawling fish first put forward by J.L.B. Smith. Smith said, uh, yeah, they are creeping on the bottom, uh, like seals, and of course they don't. They are not walking. They are continuous hovering above the ground. The coelacanth moves unlike any other fish of this size. Its oil-filled body allows it to maintain neutral buoyancy and float in any position. Six fins are almost constantly in motion, like oars in the water. Upper and lower fins toward the rear of the creature, plus two pairs of limb-like fins, front and center. And there was something surprising about the way these limb-like fins moved. Although the coelacanth was not using them to crawl on the bottom, to the expert eye, their motion hinted at walking. walking like we do. According to Susan Jewett, the fish collection manager at the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History, and an international expert in coelacanth biology. It's got paired pectoral fins and paired pelvic fins. These are particularly interesting because this fish has what's called a tetrapod form of swimming we, being tetrapods, have all learned that uh, when we walk, we move the right arm forward in synchrony with the left leg. Well, the fish sort of swims like that with that right pectoral and the left pelvic going in synchrony with one another. Um, very interesting characteristics, which again is one of very many characteristics that place it in that evolutionary line towards higher vertebrates. If the coelacanth swims like a land animal walks, does that too suggest it's our closest living relative among the fishes? To this day, the evidence is inconclusive. Until recently, most researchers put coelacanths nearest to tetrapods on an evolutionary tree. But now, a group known as lungfish is thought to be an even closer ancestor, based on new DNA evidence. We may never know for certain which group of fishes contains our closest living relative. Still, the coelacanth continues to surprise science at every turn. 6,000 miles from the Comoros, on the other side of the Indian Ocean in Indonesia, the sudden discovery of a coelacanth would disrupt the lives of two young scientists. An uncanny echo of the events in South Africa some 60 years before. Mark Erdman, a marine biologist studying coral shrimp, and Arnaz Mehta, a naturalist, had just started a life together as husband and wife here in Indonesia when the coelacanth made its unexpected appearance. It all began in the local fish market when Mark and Arnaz, stepping out of a taxi, spotted a strange-looking fish on a fish cart. I went over to the cart, and I stared at this fish, uh, looking, thinking it was a grouper at first, but then the head was all wrong, and the, everything was wrong about it. And then I called Mark over, and, the, and our other two friends, they came and looked at it, and Mark sort of in disbelief said it was a coelacanth. It just seemed really kind of incredulous that we could step out of a taxi in a city of over half a million people and see something that was really a big deal go wheeling by on a fish cart. They took a photograph, but did not purchase the fish, thinking Indonesian coelacanths were already well known to science. But they soon learned the uniqueness of their sighting. No scientist had ever found a coelacanth, except near South Africa and the Comoros Islands. Mark and Arnaz quickly embarked on a quest to find a second specimen. 
Like J.L.B. Smith before them, they enlisted the aid of local fishermen. A new hunt was on for the elusive coelacanth. As in the Comoros, this fish was known locally. Fishermen called it Raja Laut, king of the sea. Mark wanted to make sure that if one was captured again by these fishermen, that he would be able to get it. So he offered a very modest award, uh, reward rather. I think it was perhaps double the market price and it, it's not a good eating fish. So the market price couldn't have been very high, but it was enough to entice the fishermen to bring it to him when they caught it. And that's exactly what happened. Then, 10 months after the initial sighting, Mark and Arnaz had a visit. And my boatman showed up and he burst out, Ada Rajalaut, come with, there's a coelacanth on the beach. We rushed down the stairs, Arnaz grabbed the video camera and uh, we went down to see if this was indeed the fish. Like all of its predecessors, the creature soon found life at the surface impossible. But before the great fish died, the couple took it out to deeper water to get photographs in a more natural setting. Arnaz even had a few moments to swim alongside. The fish had been caught several hours earlier and it was really down to its final hour. During that time, you know, her fins were still moving, still flouncing, and then her dorsal fin would raise, and then once in a while she would take a big gulp of water. And she was extremely calm um, in her inevitable demise. I couldn't get over how beautiful her scales were. There are, there are these, you know, these scales that were speckled with these gold flecks. And um, it was like, it was like a slow dance. It's certainly sad to watch such a majestic beast die so slowly. When DNA samples of the Indonesian coelacanth were sequenced, they suggested that this was a new species and dissuaded scientists from the idea that the Indonesian fish was a stray. In fact, from the DNA analysis, it seems that the two populations were separated many millions of years ago. Once again, the mysterious fossil fish surprised scientists around the world. The Indonesian discovery upset the whole apple cart. Um, science was all nice and happy. They'd got these little um, enclaves in the Comores all sorted out and that anything that was outside that was astray. Now all of a sudden, um, 10,000 kilometers away, right across the other side of the Indian Ocean, we have another colony of coelacanths. And it's not just one or two, it's not strays, it's a colony. They are known to the Indonesian fishermen, which suggests to me that, that um, they're actually more, far more widespread than, than we think. The fact that, uh, that we could find this animal in a place that's relatively well known to ichthyologists, it would not surprise me in the least if over the next 50 or 100 years that it is revealed that the coelacanth actually exists pretty much in one continuous population from the Western Indian Ocean all the way up to Indonesia. J.L.B. Smith didn't live to hear the story of the Indonesian coelacanth. In 1968, after years of ill health and in constant pain, Smith took his own life. He was 70 years old. Marjorie Courtney Latimer celebrated her 93rd birthday in February 2000. She was the first in a long chain of people whose lives were touched by this ancient fish. I 
I think that all my life I was called to do what I did in my life. And uh, it all came as a wonderful kind of circle of events, finding this wonderful fish. There's something about the ancient nature of this fish and the story that goes with it that intrigues people so much and pulls them in. It's just something magical about it. I first saw the coelacanth probably in about 1956. The original mounted specimen in the East London Museum. To me, it was this fantastic creature from the past, which gave us a window into the past and made us kind of realize life began in the sea, from the sea, the, the, the vertebrate, the backbone animals crawled out onto land, and that's where the evolution of, of terrestrial vertebrates started. The final riddle. The coelacanth may never have stepped onto land, but if this living fossil was able to avoid extinction and detection for so many millions of years, what other strange and wonderful creatures may also be down there? It really does say something about how little we know about the oceans. Very definitely that goes a long way in explaining the mystique of the coelacanth and, and, and its, its enrapturing effect on the public. Because that's kind of a weird thing if you really think about it. It's just a big, ugly old fish. But there is something more to it, and, and that, it's, that, it's that, that quality of the unknown of the deep. For over half a century, this creature has attracted the scrutiny of scientists worldwide. Yet so many questions remain unanswered. Do coelacanths live in all the world's oceans? How large are their populations? How long do they live? Over the next half century, scientists will continue to explore these secrets, and perhaps more lives will be touched by this mysterious survivor.